In this video, you will learn about the independent samples t-test and the corresponding effect size and confidence interval. We will follow an example throughout the video. A researcher developed a new lesson on the alphabet for preschool children. To determine the effectiveness of the new lesson, she randomly assigned 10 students to the treatment group, those students who were taught with the new lesson, and 10 students to the control group, those students who were taught with the traditional lesson. At the end of the lesson, she recorded the number of letters correctly recalled by each child. She wanted to know if the new lesson affected student recall of the alphabet. In this scenario, we have one independent variable and one dependent variable. The independent variable is group membership. Students participating in the new lesson are in the treatment group. Students receiving traditional instruction are in the control group. The independent variable is a nominal variable with two categories. The dependent variable is the number of letters correctly recalled. It is a continuous variable. The independent samples t-test is appropriate for a design with a continuous dependent variable and a discrete independent variable with two levels. Our main interest is the difference of means for the two groups. We would like to know if the participants in each group are from the same distribution or two different distributions. The figure on the left illustrates the case where examinees come from the same population. That is, both groups have the same population mean. The figure on the right shows the case where examinees come from two different populations, with each population having a different mean value. The purpose of the independent samples t-test is to determine whether the two groups have the same population mean or different population means. The figure on the left is consistent with the null hypothesis. The figure on the right is consistent with the alternative hypothesis. We can state the hypotheses as a non-directional or one-sided test. The version you choose depends on your research questions. For a non-directional test, the null hypothesis states that the difference of means equals zero. The alternative states that the difference of means does not equal zero. Group 1 could have a higher mean than group 2 if the alternative is true, or group 1 could have a lower mean than group 2 if the alternative is true. Note that the group labels are arbitrary. It does not matter which group you call group 1 and which you call group 2. However, once you assign a label to a group, you must use that same label for your hypotheses and the calculation of your test statistic. The order of subtraction is important, and that's why you need to keep the same labels throughout your calculations. For a lower tail test, the alternative hypothesis states that the mean for group 1 is less than the mean for group 2. That is, when subtracting mu2 from mu1, we get a negative number. The null hypothesis contradicts the alternative and indicates that the difference of means is zero or positive meaning that mu1 is equal to or larger than mu2. For an upper tail test, the alternative hypothesis states that the mean for group 1 is greater than the mean for group 2. That is, when subtracting mu2 from mu1, we get a positive number. The null hypothesis contradicts the alternative and indicates that the difference of means is zero or negative, meaning that mu1 is equal to or smaller than mu2. There is another way to specify the null and alternative hypotheses. The statements on the right are equivalent to the ones on the left. Use either method for stating the null and alternative hypotheses. The method on the left, however, is preferred because it is consistent with the way the test statistic is written. The equation on the top left portion of the slide shows the independent samples t-test. The numerator is the difference of sample means subtracted by the difference of population means when the null hypothesis is true. Note that the difference of population means is usually zero as indicated by the null hypothesis. For this reason, you will often see the independent samples t-test written with only the difference of sample means in the numerator. The numerator is divided by the standard error. This quantity is computed differently than the way it was computed with the one sample t-test because we must account for the variance within each group. The symbol S squared subpooled is a pooled within group variance. It is computed by adding the sum of squares for each group and dividing that quantity by the degrees of freedom. In this case, the degrees of freedom is the total sample size minus two. 
We compare the observed t-statistic to a critical value from the t-distribution. We choose a critical value from a t-distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom that has 100 alpha percent of the area in the rejection region. If the test statistic is more extreme than the critical value in the direction of the alternative, we reject the null hypothesis. We make several assumptions when using the independent samples t-test. First, we assume that participants are randomly sampled from their respective populations. Random sampling helps external validity of the experiment because random sampling implies that we know the target population and its eligible members. That is, we clearly know the population and the people to whom we plan to generalize the results. A second assumption is that participants are independent. We can establish this assumption by randomly assigning participants to one of two groups and collecting data in a way that one participant's work does not influence another's. Random assignment supports the internal validity of the study. With random assignment, groups are randomly equivalent at the beginning of the study. Any difference between the groups at the end of the study can be attributed to the independent variable. A third assumption is that values are normally distributed in the population. We can check this assumption using a normal QQ plot. The last assumption is homogeneity of variance. It means that the variance is the same in each population distribution. This assumption is needed to compute the t-test with a pooled variance. If homogeneity variance is violated, we can still compute the t-statistic, but we use a different method and adjust the degrees of freedom. In fact, this alternative method is done by most statistical software. The alternative approach is referred to as Welch's t-test, and it does not require the assumption of equal variances. In addition to the hypothesis test, we can compute a confidence interval for the difference of means. The equation for a two-sided confidence interval is shown here. The left-hand side is the difference of means, and the right-hand side is the margin of error. The margin of error is the critical value times the standard error. This standard error is the same quantity that's in the denominator of the hypothesis test for the independent samples t-test. The confidence interval should be formed in a way that is consistent with the alternative hypothesis. A lower tail test should have a one-sided confidence interval with an upper bound. An upper tail test should have a one-sided confidence interval with a lower bound. To be complete, we should also compute Cohen's d effect size. The numerator is the difference of sample means minus the difference of population means given by the null. The difference of population means is usually zero, which simplifies the equation. The denominator is the pooled standard deviation, not the pooled variance. Notice the slight difference in notation. There is no superscript on the letter S. The interpretation of Cohen's D is the same as it was with the one sample t-test. It describes the effect in standard deviation units. If the effect size is 1.2, it means that the two means are 1.2 standard deviations away from each other. Returning to the alphabet study, the researchers' data are shown in the table on the right. Descriptive statistics for each group are shown on the left. The treatment group had a larger sample mean, but can we generalize this result to the population? That is, are the population means different? Remember that the researcher wanted to know if the lesson affected recall of the alphabet. There is no direction to this question. Therefore, we will conduct a non-directional or two-tailed test. The alternative hypothesis states that the population mean of the treatment group does not equal the population mean of the control group. Here we use the subscript T to indicate the treatment group, the group who participated in the new lesson. We use the subscript C to indicate the control group, or those students who received the traditional instruction. We will conduct the test at a 5% significance level. Since the experiment involved 20 students, we have 18 degrees of freedom. This information leads to a T critical value of 2.1. You can obtain this value from statistical software or a T distribution table in a statistics book. Substituting sample statistics into the T test equation we get an observed t value of 2.82. This value is more extreme than the critical value, therefore we reject the null hypothesis. 
Cohen's D shows that the two means differ by 1.26 standard deviations. According to the 95% confidence interval, the difference of means is between 0.92 and 6.28. There is a separate video that demonstrates the specific steps in making these calculations. Putting it all together, we can write the following summary. A new lesson for teaching the alphabet to preschoolers resulted in significantly more letters learned than the traditional method with a T statistic of 2.82 and a significance level of 0.05. Cohen's D effect size indicated that students in the new lesson scored 1.26 standard deviations higher than students in the traditional lesson. With 95% confidence, students in the new lesson learned between 0.92 and 6.28 more letters than students in the traditional lesson.